Welcome everyone to the eighth installment of the Senior Leadership Insights Series, sponsored by the Graduate School and offered in partnership with the Department of History. This series was created and developed by a group of volunteers from the Graduate Board of Visitors, some of whom are joining us in the audience today. My name is Melissa Bostrom. I'm the Assistant Dean for Graduate Student Professional Development in the Graduate School, and I'll be our MC for today. To make the most of our focused time together, I'll address a few logistics up front. We'll begin the conversation with six key questions that we ask each of our featured guests. And after that, we'll welcome your questions. If you'd like to speak, you can use the raise hand option accessible through the reactions button in the lower right corner of your Zoom window. This session is being recorded. So if you prefer not to appear in the recording, please keep your video muted and share your questions in the chat. With those details out of the way, I'd like now to briefly introduce Dr. Adrian Lent Smith, Associate Professor and Associate Chair in the Department of History. A scholar of African American history, as well as the histories of the 20th century United States and the US and the world, Professor Lent Smith is the author of Freedom Struggles African Americans and World War I from Harvard University Press. She has served as a consultant to the documentary The Jazz Ambassadors, as well as to the Library of Congress exhibit Echoes of the Great War. And she can be seen on the documentaries, The Great War, Hellfighters, and Voice of Freedom. A senior fellow in Duke's Keenan Institute for Ethics, Dr. Lent Smith hosts Keenan's community conversation series, The Ethics of Now, and is a distinguished lecturer for the Organization of American Historians. Professor Lent Smith, I'll turn things over to you to introduce our special guest today, Dean Brown Nagan. Thanks, Melissa. Um, our guest today is Tamika Brown Nagan. She's the Dean of the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard University, the Daniel D.S. Paul Professor of Constitutional Law at Harvard Law School, and a member of the History Department in the Harvard Faculty of Arts and Sciences, a frequent lecturer and media commentator about issues in law, history, and higher education. Brown Nagan has published articles and book chapters on a wide range of topics, including the Supreme Court's equal um, protection jurisprudence, civil rights law and history, the Affordable Care Act, and education reform. Her 2011 book, Courage to Dissent, Atlanta and the Long History of the Civil Rights Movement, won six awards, including the Bancroft Prize in US history, which if you're not a historian, is like the Oscars um, or the César of, of US history. Her late, in her latest book, Civil Rights Queen, Constance Baker Motley and the Struggle for Equality, Brown Nagan explores the life and times of Constance Baker Motley, the pathbreaking lawyer, politician, and judge. Brown Nagan assumed her leadership role with the Radcliffe Institute in 2018. In 2019, she was appointed chair of the Presidential Committee on Harvard and the Legacy of Slavery, which is anchored at the Radcliffe Institute. She's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Law Institute, and the American Philosophical Society, a fellow of the American Bar Foundation, and a distinguished lecturer for the Organization of American Historians. She earned a law degree from Yale University, her master's and PhD in history from Duke University, and a BA from Furman. She's a past member of the Graduate School's Board of Visitors as well. It's my great pleasure and the Graduate School's great pleasure to welcome Dean Tamika brown Nagan back to Duke virtually for today's conversation. Hi, and thanks for coming. Hi, Adrian. Thank you so much for uh, being my interlocutor for this program and thanks to the Graduate School for inviting me. I am delighted to see my Duke friends again. We're delighted to have you. I'm gonna open with a general question um, just to get us rolling. Would you tell us about your background and what your path was to your current role? Sure, happy to. I, as you mentioned, uh, earned my JD from Yale and my PhD in history from Duke. And now am uh, Dean of the Radcliffe Institute, which is one of Harvard's several schools. I think there are about 10 of them. Uh, Radcliffe is unique in that it is the successor to Radcliffe College, the uh, women's college um, uh, of Harvard. Uh, it was created in 1999 after Harvard and Radcliffe Colleges joined. And these days, Radcliffe has three parts. One is a fellowship program 
Uh, another is a public engagement uh, program. And then there is a Schlesinger Library on the history of women in America. Um, to tell you a little bit about uh, our fellowship program, we invite 50 scholars to campus every year from across the sciences, social sciences, arts, humanities, and the professions. Uh, and so the, the fellowship program is really the, uh, the anchor, I would say, of, of the Institute's life. We invite people, um, most of the scholars come from across the country, in fact, across the world. And we also have a, a few local scholars in the fellowship program. Um, the public engagement component of Radcliffe is really important. It's where we invite speakers uh, internally, mostly externally, to give talks um, that the entire campus is invited to attend. Uh, and the uh, the entire community. And I will say that over the past two years, because of COVID, we've been able to attract really large audiences from across the world and have been happy with that. Uh, and then finally, I will mention that Radcliffe is a convener for all of Harvard. Uh, and that means that we do things like anchor university-wide initiatives. And you mentioned one, the Harvard Legacy of Slavery initiative, uh, and all of that keeps us very busy, I will say, Adrian. I can imagine. So um, that's a lot of moving parts in a place with a lot of moving parts. Mm -hmm. What is your, I mean, can you describe a typical day or is there no such thing for you? Yeah, so it is true. It, it's, a, it's a spinning wheel within a spinning wheel. Um, it, it's, it's a place that I love because it's interdisciplinary. Um, you know, Harvard is famously, as I think is true of every big research university, um, uh, it, it's, it's decentralized and it can be hard to even encounter on this campus scholars who are working in one's uh, area of uh, one's discipline. And so Radcliffe is a place where um, one really can engage with scholars across disciplinary boundaries, and that is why I love it. Um, in terms of a typical day, I will say um, it might involve being uh, engaged with the fellowship program, either listening to a talk or at a certain time of year, we will be engaged in selecting our fellows. Um, I might, on a typical day, introduce a, a speaker for one of our public lectures. And as I said, they're really wonderful uh, speakers who come in and draw broad audiences. Um, I also manage the budget for Radcliffe and meet with other administrators who work um, in finance or in communications. Um, and the, the final thing I'll mention that might uh, come up on a daily basis or on a periodic basis, I should say, is sitting on the academic council with the president and the provost and other deans where we uh, talk about policy and any number of matters that might pop up uh, around here that implicate policy or planning. And a lot of that over the past two years has been just a long series of meetings about COVID and how it has affected staff, faculty, and students. Yeah. So I have questions about your doctoral training and kind of where that fits in, but to go back to the trajectory question for a second, you know, when you were, like even before you got to graduate school, when you were a younger person thinking about who you were going to be as an older person, like what did you envision? I mean, you're a Dean of the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study. Were you going around saying, I wanna be a lawyer, I wanna be a professor, someday I'm gonna be a Dean. Like what, yeah. what, what got you here? Right, definitely did not anticipate uh, being a part of academic administration. It, it was an opportunity that was presented to me that I was happy to take on because it's mission consistent uh, in the ways that I, I mentioned, the interdisciplinary uh, part of it. We also uh, seek to study and advance the study of women in history. Uh, and I enjoy the position for that reason as well. But when I was growing up, you know, I, I grew up in, um, in upstate South Carolina. Uh, and I 
always thought that I would be a lawyer, a civil rights lawyer, from the time I was I was very young, um, and uh, maintained that interest, but then had a uh, a moment of uncertainty, many minutes of uncertainty, actually, when I was um, an undergraduate because I was I attended a small liberal arts college where the the selling point is that you get to know your professors really well, which I did. I was a history major, and I sort of fell in love with the idea of studying history and uh, you know pursuing the life of the mind, which is what brought me to uh, graduate school, applying to graduate school. Uh, and over time, I stopped experiencing the desire to engage with civil rights and study history as a conflict. I realized that I could bring those two together. And that's precisely what I have managed to do in my career. You know, I wanted to be a lawyer too. And then I took a class with Leon Higginbotham and loved him and it and the storytelling around cases. But every time I tried to read a brief, I fell asleep and I thought, oh, this isn't gonna work. So, um, but I figured out what did work in there. Um, sort of in this path and then kind of reconciling and sort of getting where you did, what do you see as the value that doctoral training has added to your professional trajectory? Mm. Well, um I am, I am happy to say that my training in graduate school was truly, I will say, the, the happiest educational time of my life. It really was. I, I loved, I loved graduate school. Um, just the ability to read and write about fascinating topics under the tutelage of people like Bill Chafe, who was just wonderful. Uh, and, and so supportive, it was just extraordinary. And that training and the, the, the spirit of people with whom I trained has really followed me into my career. It's integral to my scholarship, to my sense of mission around educating and mentoring students. Uh, it's a big part of my identity. And the approach to um, doctoral training that I learned at Duke and the discipline, the focus on social history is very much a part of my, my life, my, um, and my mindset as a scholar, uh, all of which is vital to the administrative responsibilities because I have this abiding um, uh, interest in bringing disciplines together and helping people communicate across disciplinary boundaries and also, I'm always thinking about ways of reaching and supporting students, uh, which we'll, we're able to do at Radcliffe, even though we don't actually award degrees um, anymore. Uh, what else can I say? Well, I, as we were discussing before we went on air, I just published a book um, that continues the, um, the scholarly trajectory of bringing together social and legal history. And so my, my graduate school training is always with me. Um, the, the people, uh, as I said, who were important to me, including uh, Jacqueline Looney, uh, Bill Chafe, uh, Nancy Hewitt when she was at Duke, just at Ray Gavins, just a whole range of people um, were very important to my, my life and, and my sense of what I should be doing in this position and in any position that I take. And so, um, it's, it's, it's ever with me. So there are good legal historians who don't have JDs, but how do you feel that your JD, you mentioned your book on Constant Baker Mark, Mot Motley, but also the Atlanta book, like how does your JD shape your historical work? And does it have some role in your present, like professional, like work? work? Mm -hmm. Yeah, in terms of shaping my historical work, yes, it definitely does. You're, you're right that there are great legal historians who don't have JDs, um, and I, I'm, I'm happy to, to have them in the field. At the same time, the, those of us who have JDs do tend to go more deeply into the, the law itself, into the legal cases, legal institutions, uh, and have a better sense of uh, those institutions and uh, 
uh, for thinking of my current book, how being a part of uh, legal institutions constrained what this uh, lawyer, Constance Baker Motley, could accomplish once she was a judge. Uh, and so it, it's, it's vitally important to be able to join the two types of training. Um, the JD is also important because it essentially is a way of going about problem solving. And that's what I do all day, every day. Just problem after problem after problem uh, lands on my desk and I have to um, think about what it is I'm actually seeing um, and, and go from there. It, it helps with, it helps bring an analytical lens. Um, it helps me, frankly, um, not be afraid of problems because it's just what I'm accustomed to, to dealing with. So it's useful in that way. And then um, the JD is also all about uh, communicating and there's a dimension of it that has to do with um, engaging with other people, interpersonal skills, and, and those are vitally important as well to my current uh, position. I bet also you don't fall asleep when you read briefs. <laughs> I do not. I might become a little hyper, Adriana. <laughs> Are there any skills, training, or experiences that you wish you'd had in graduate school to prepare you for your current career path? Mm. So that's, a, that's an interesting question. Um, what I would say is that I wish I had had more training about pedagogy teaching uh, and interacting with students. Now, as it turned out, I had a, a really wonderful fellowship um, that supported my, my education when I was in graduate school. It actually did not require me to do any teaching. And so, um, it, which, which is a double-edged sword. So when I started teaching, I was teaching for the very first time. Um, and I do think it's important to, uh, for all, uh, trainers of graduate school uh, students to, to think about just helping students along. Um, and that's particularly the case, I would say, as we are um, in this really interesting moment uh, with changing norms or norms that should have been changed around um, uh, you know, gender, um, and, and race, and all of those are competencies uh, that one could teach. And I, I wish that uh, I had had some of that, and frankly, some of my peers had had that <laughs> in graduate school. Right. Sometimes you wish for things on behalf of others as much as you <laughs> wish for them on behalf yes. of yourself. So if there is someone who's thinking not just about becoming uh, a professor, but going into academic administration, like um, what can students who'd like to work in, so the question is this field broadly speaking, but I think even more focused to some extent in academic administration, um, what can they do to perfect, pre prepare or what can they do to explore it further to figure mm -hmm. out if they, wanna, if they wanna try it? Yeah, I would say, um that they should take on leadership roles in a professional organization. Uh, and one can start this you know, very early in one's career uh, by taking on a role in the AHA or the OAH or whatever the, the organization might be. Uh, and also doing that on campus. I remember, um, I actually can't remember the name of the society, but there was a Society of Black Graduate Students, I'm sure Jackie would remember it, um, that a number of graduate students um, became involved in uh, when they were in their uh, upper years in graduate school. Um, so just trying to figure out what leadership entails uh, while also learning um, and coming to some point of view about how educational institutions or disciplines should, should proceed, what they need to be providing to um, students and to uh, faculty and staff. I think it's important to begin to reach some conclusions about those things and just take on um, 
you know, roles with responsibility, increasing levels of responsibility, and sooner or later, uh, someone will probably notice and ask you to do something <laughs> okay. uh, like like chair department, right. uh, something of that nature. Yeah. Um, was that organization the Hurston James Society? Yes, yes, yes. Hurston James. Hurston James, um, which uh, yeah was an important part of our lives. Yeah which I don't know if it existed sort of as a straight line from the time you were here till now, or my sense is that some graduate students revived it somewhere mm -hmm. along the way. But mm -hmm. I think that's also a, kind, a, a form of leadership to see what has been to build on the, the work of the past and, and, and extend it, right? To let things that aren't important wither on the vine, to oh, not let things that are important wither on the vine. That's right, that's right. To see the need for um, organizations that help create community and sustain community. Uh, I think that one of the uh, things about, that, that one hears about graduate school that turns out, if you believe it, to be a disadvantage is the, the notion of going it alone. Um, you know, you figure out what you wanna study and you, um, you work with your advisor and you develop a dissertation and so forth and so on. Um, actually, the key, I would say, is building community, engaging with other people. Um, it, helps, it helps personally, but also helps professionally in thinking things through. And I will say that law schools um, have a more routine um, uh, process of engagement around scholarship, um, a workshopping model that is routine for, for law schools um, in a way that I, I don't know is routine for other disciplines, but it, it's, it's a way of making the point that it's so important to try to create community uh, and, and support. Um, and uh, I would commend that to graduate students too. So we had a question come in during registration that in some ways is the opposite of the question that I just asked you, where one of the registrants um, asked, what would you say to faculty who are not interested in leadership positions to get them to think about it, to be open to the possibility of doing it? Hmm. Um, so that's an interesting question. Uh, and and how, how can I answer it. Um, well, I, I'll say this, you know, being in, in educational institutions, academic institutions, there is no shortage of opinions about how things should work, <laughs> right? And what I would say is if you have a lot of opinions about how things should go or how things aren't going the way you think that they should go, you got to get involved. Um, it, it's about governance, uh, faculty governance, and I think that it works best if everyone is invested in it. Um, and it, it's vital to have different perspectives and different voices um, represented in faculty governance. So I, I would say if you love uh, what you're doing, if you uh, care about um, other people, your colleagues, your students, it's important to get involved. Thank you. I'll throw, the, throw it back over to Melissa for a sec. Thank you, Adrian. So it looks like I, we already have some questions lined up and we want to encourage the audience to use this time to ask your questions. Again, you can use the raise hand function or you can type your question in the chat. Dean Looney. Thank you, Tamika. Oh, and Adrian, what a great conversation. So, Tamika, I want you to talk about the mentoring gap. I know you wrote a piece around 2015, 16, uh, when we were having a lot of campus protests and you were talking about students from underrepresented communities. And one of the things that you mentioned was, that you proposed was a more interpersonal model of engagement and accountability for inclusion. But, but you tied it all to mentoring. And, and we talked about it briefly uh, at some point. Can you say a bit about that? Sure, uh, happy to. I have a, a, a great passion for mentoring students in part because I 
experienced great mentoring myself in people like Bill Chafe and some of the others um, that I mentioned. And I, I know it was the difference between uh, thriving and maybe being merely successful. Um, I know that it was. It, it, it makes a huge difference when, um, especially for students who are coming from backgrounds where they just don't have uh, professional models to be supported, to be brought along in the way that I was brought along. And I will tell you, um, uh, Jackie, that when I first came to Duke as a graduate student, I was, there came a time when I was acutely aware that, oh, my, my peer's father is this one and that one. And, and the other student's mother is you know, a professor here and there. And I was a first generation college student. Um, because of just some things about my own makeup, I, I didn't, I didn't um, think that it meant that I couldn't succeed but it was notable. I, I understood that there were some things about how the profession worked that I couldn't know that other people did know. Um, and it, it's, and the, the point to make is that um, I would have been the same, I would have had the same quality of mind without mentoring, but I'm not sure that I would have gotten as far. And, and so, I think it's important to appreciate that mentoring is not about, well, I'll say it this way. One has to have the intellect, right? To succeed in graduate school, but that's not nearly enough. It takes so much more to be successful. Um, scholars talk about the hidden curriculum. Um, one has to know how to engage professors, how to attract um, the interest of professors. And that's especially important for um, students who are coming from historically marginalized backgrounds. I was saying to one of my students the other day, I know it's been the case that during my educational career, I've essentially made people mentor me, right? Um, just had to do so much work to set them at ease, um, to just present myself as just like every other student. And so these are some of the things that I, I was thinking about when I was writing that piece um, and that I continue to talk about uh, here today at Harvard and everywhere I go essentially, because I am pretty certain that a lot of colleagues think that if students don't do well, it has to be because they're not smart enough. Uh, I think that is not actually the issue. It is figuring out how to not only find, but nurture talent. Um, and I, I think that is something we need to talk about again and again. Thanks. So it looks like, I'll read out the question in the chat, yeah. Um, it looks like there's a question in the chat that says, um, Thank you, Dr. Brown Nagan. I'm a first year MPP student interested in bringing an interdisciplinary lens to policy making and research around criminal justice reform. I'm thinking about pursuing a joint JD PhD degree in history, sociology, or public policy. History. What advice do you have to someone who has multiple disciplinary interests and wants to combine them, but is unsure how to move forward in selecting a focus area? Mm -hmm. So that's a good question. Um, you know, public policy school is very different from uh, uh, pursuing a PhD in history. So I would think that the first thing to do is talk to people in the fields, in those respective fields, and really figure out how they're different. Um, and when you do, and when you figure that out, I think that will go a long way towards uh, sending you along one path or the other. Um, because it's a difference between, you know, researching an issue and, and engaging with um, uh, other scholars in one's discipline and really being externally focused, which is the way I think about public policy work. Uh, the, the other thing I will say is, um, 
you know, although I, I ended up doing a JD PhD, it is not something I would recommend lightly um, to, to people. It, it takes a long time. Um, depending on what you want to do, it's, it's not necessary. One really does need to be placed well because otherwise you could end up with uh, a lot of loans that you can't repay because um, uh, you, don't, you don't necessarily have the resources for placement that you need, none of which is meant to be discouraging, it's just to, meant to be realistic. Uh, so good luck to you as you pursue your, your path. And again, I urge you to just reach out to some people and see what it is they do on a daily basis. That is wonderful advice. And we want to thank the audience members for your wonderful questions that you've shared today and your engagement. It's been such a thrill to feature Dean Brown Nagin today after the delight of hearing her media appearances over the last few weeks, being interviewed about her new book. And I want to extend a special thank you to Professor Adrian Lentz Smith, who's been a wonderful, wonderful interviewer today. We look forward to seeing many of you for future events in this series with our next Senior Leadership Insights conversation planned for March 23rd, featuring chemistry PhD alumna, Dr. Lori Lehman, who is most recently Vice President with Gilead Sciences. Thank you everyone and good afternoon. Thanks everybody. Thanks everybody.